Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. Uh, I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. Well, Ali, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Michael, and it's it's great to see uh, many many of you who I uh, had the opportunity to meet when I was uh, with you at the Indiana Center back in I think it was October 2018. Yes, for sure, and of course uh, you have friends from all around the country uh, on this Zoom call as well. And so, because you have so many friends here, uh, Ali. I wanted to just uh, check in with you. How are you doing health-wise during the pandemic? And, and how are your parents? Uh, I know your dad, of course, Hassan Abu Nima. How are your parents doing in Amman? Thank you for asking. I'm, I'm happy to say they're doing well. Um, of course, Jordan, like everywhere else, is confronting this uh, pandemic. Uh, Fortunately, so far, there have been no widespread outbreaks in Jordan. Um, it's, it's been under control, um, but, you know, people are suffering economically and socially as, as they are everywhere. But I'm glad to say they're doing fine. And uh, I'm happy to say I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, uh, I'm fortunate that I'm able to do my work. Uh, from home, as are my colleagues at the Electronic Intifada. So uh, we're lucky in that respect, but we're very conscious that many people are working in, in much more dangerous um, and risky conditions or not able to work at all. So we, we count our blessings. Well, good, good, good. Well, and uh, uh, we've been thinking about you, especially uh, uh, in the heart of things in Chicago. So I'm glad you hear all is well with you. Uh, Ali, you referenced being here in Fort Wayne when you were here uh, almost two years ago now. The title of your talk, I don't know if you remember, but the title of your talk audaciously was The Palestinians Are Winning. Um, well, you know, I think my title, the Palesti or, or my opening sentence to my book, The Palestinians Are Winning, was audacious when I wrote it, and it's still now, but I, I still very much stand by it. And, uh, you know, to be clear what I mean, I'm certainly not um, underestimating the amount of suffering and the amount of uh, oppression that Israel is, is still inflicting on Palestinians. But what I was referring to is the change in political discourse, really the political sea change, which I think we're seeing with the kinds of electoral wins that you uh, just um, mentioned in the past uh, past slew of elections. Um, and I think other signs of this, this deep change in discussion uh, were when just a couple of weeks ago, Peter Beinart, the sort of the well-known liberal Zionist writer, um, basically Came, came out and said that he no longer supports a two-state solution and instead of seeking Israeli-Palestinian separation, which has really been the model for many decades, we should be seeking um, Palestinian and Israeli-Jewish equality. So I think those changes are, are still escalating and uh, or accumulating and nothing I see the Israel lobby doing, Israel and its lobby doing, to try to uh, silence us, to try to uh, put this discussion back in the model. Nothing I see them doing is really working. But that, do that is not to underestimate the scale of the um, challenges we still face. Um, I want to say, I want you to say a little bit more about uh, um, uh, the situation here in the U.S., uh, we'll get to we'll get to the presidential election later on, but uh, even with these victories in the uh, congressional primaries, the Washington Post ran an op-ed uh, just last Friday that, uh, written by three Palestinian American human rights activists, entitled "The 2020 Democratic Platform 
betrays Palestinians and again gives Israel a pass. Mm. So even with these victories, there's still a number of hurdles yet to be uh, yet to be jumped. Talk a little bit about uh, the democratic platform and maybe some other obstacles. Yeah, what what we're seeing uh, in the democratic platform fight is um, really a, a microcosm of the battle that has been raging in the um, in the uh, grassroots of the Democratic Party for a number of years, and so uh, we, you know, the, the primary victories we've seen by some progressives who are very open about their support for Palestinian rights, even supportive of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, comes against the backdrop where the establishment is still very firmly in the old model, where you don't criticize Israel, where um, unquestioning support for Israel is the one bipartisan issue. That's the one thing they agree with the Republicans on. And so... um, that's what you get with uh, a nominee or, a, you know, uh, as he is going to be the nominee, someone like Joe Biden, who spent his entire career in that mold, who is a very strong supporter of Israel and who will use whatever um, control or leverage he has over the uh, apparatus of the Democratic Party to, to force that agenda on everyone else. And so that's the battle that's taking place. What we saw in the platform committee really uh, uh, in the last uh, week or so, as we've seen in previous years, when Bernie Sanders was was more involved in it last year and the, uh, you know, last uh, time around, uh, sorry, was um, efforts to put in the uh, platform language that at least acknowledges Uh, Palestinian rights, at least acknowledges the reality that Palestinians are living under Israeli occupation. And this year, that's what happened as well. There were efforts to amend the platform to include recognition of um, Israeli occupation, to place very modest conditions on on U.S. military aid to Israel. And those were rejected completely by the establishment, by the, let's say, the corporate establishment wing of the Democratic Party. But that's not going to make these issues go away, and it's not going to silence the grassroots. I think, if anything, it's going to feed the determination of grassroots activists to ensure that their voices are heard, because it's not just on the question of Palestine that, um, you know, the the party establishment is shutting uh, people out. Similarly, you know, they, they, one of the most popular policies in the grassroots of the Democratic Party is Medicare for All. The platform, yeah. they wouldn't even allow a vote on that, let alone to actually adopt that as the party policy. So you have to see that question of Palestine within the broader context of the fight uh, in the Democratic Party. I'm not so confident that the the fight can ever really be won within the Democratic Party the way it is. A lot of people are saying, well, maybe we need to find an alternative. I, I think that comes out of the frustration that many people feel time and again, seeing grassroots voices and progressive voices shut out and slapped down. But nevertheless, the battle goes on. And when there are victories in it, we, we celebrate them. You were, you were one of the very first people to, uh, that I know of to talk about the one state solution. We've interviewed uh, Awad Abdel Fattah and Jeff Halper uh, in this platform about their plan. How do you assess the situation uh, these days given Israel's annexation plans? Well, I, you know, I mentioned uh, Peter Beinart coming to, to uh, to the conclusion that a one-state solution is inevitable. And of course, you know, that, that created a lot of discussion and he was given an op-ed in the, in the New York Times and was invited onto many shows to talk about his views. And as many people pointed out, these are positions that Palestinians, including myself, had been talking about for many, many years. Um, myself, you know, I, my book, One Country, um, 
putting forward a one state solution came out, I think in 2006. So that's, that's 14, almost 15 years ago now. Um, but so, you know, for us, for people like us, maybe it's old news, but uh, it, w it, it was big news for a lot of the people who followed Peter Beinart or who read the New York Times or who listened to NPR for whom, uh, you know, the, the idea of a one state solution was just so remote. Um, but the key point here is that the recognition of those like Peter Beinart, that this is now the way to go, comes from an understanding of the reality on the ground that it is already one single state, but it is one single state ruled by Israel according to a very unjust, very oppressive apartheid regime. And that, that the effort to separate Palestinians and Israelis uh, would do more violence and be more difficult uh, and be more unjust ultimately than uh, giving people uh, full and equal rights, uh, making restitution, making reparations, and seeking truth and justice and reconciliation. Those things aren't by any means easy. Let's, let's not pretend they're easy. But that is the path that has been um, pursued in, in pretty much every similar situation that we can think of, whether it's in South Africa or whether it's in Northern Ireland. And, and in the past few days, John Hume uh, passed yeah. away, who was one of the key figures in, in making the agreement happen. And I, I, in, in uh, my book, The Battle for Justice in Palestine, I look at both Northern Ireland and South Africa as potential models, not only to learn what was successful, but also what, uh, what we should do better because there's there's plenty of um uh you know shortcomings in in what was attempted in those places and uh you know th those are experiences we should build on not simply try to replicate your dad just a week ago wrote a, a wonderful uh op-ed in the jordan times about the one state solution and about how it's de facto i mean exactly what you said how how israel has made it a de facto uh, one state. And of course, that's something like you said, we've known for a long time now, but it still is news to many people. And especially since the, the official stance of the United States and Jordan and so many other countries is two state. Um, you've been writing recently, uh, uh, Ali, as well as your other reporters uh, about uh, uh, the, what's happening in Europe. So uh, uh, Germany recently awarded Zippy Livni their Bridge Peace Prize. Uh, their new anti-Semitism chief, you, I think you just wrote about this yesterday, is anti-Palestinian. Yet their left-wing party, Die Linke, is calling for sanction on Israel if uh, the annexation proceeds. The same for a vocal minority within the EU. Sweden, though, is encouraging business with Israel's high-tech startups linked to its surveillance industry and cyber warfare. So uh, t talk to us just in general about uh, what's happening in Europe with regard to Israel uh, and Palestine. And there are signs of hope, but there are also some danger signs too, right? Yeah, well, first, let me say thank you for being such a close reader of the electronic intifada, because uh, <laughs> Those are very much all stories that we've covered in recent weeks and months. And, um, you know, I, I'm very interested in what's happening in Europe because I think a lot of us have this idea that, uh, well, as we know, the United States is incredibly biased towards Israel. It's the biggest uh, donor of military aid and, you know, in countless ways that I think many of us are familiar with. Many of us have this impression that Europe and the European Union is somehow more even-handed, somehow more um, in support of Palestinian rights. And it's, sadly, that's not true. When we're talking about official positions and government policies, it's not true. Uh, they are, the way I like to put it is that the European Union is Donald Trump who, you know, has a discerning taste in fine wines. That, that's sadly uh, uh, what it is. Um, and we see that in terms of the massive amounts of um, 
uh, weapons trade between European countries and Israel. We see that in the massive amount of other trade, including uh, trade with Israel settlements. Uh, there's far more settlement goods that go to the European Union than come to the United States just because Europe is geographically closer to Israel. So when you're talking about shipping of um, you know, farm pr produce, uh, that tends to go to Europe rather than to the United States. And European governments have been uh, absolutely unwilling to impose any consequences on Israel whatsoever. Um, they are all talk, uh, all bark and no bite, let's say, and not that much bark to begin with. I mean, they're very cautious about criticizing Israel. And what, uh, you know, there, there are a number of factors in this. I mean, one is, a major one is Europe's general subservience to the United States. Donald Trump notwithstanding, the, the European government still see themselves as the junior partners of the Americans and want the Americans to protect them. Uh, so they tend to see um, the world through Washington's eyes, even if, even if there are some nuances. But there are also specific factors uh, you know, related to uh, Europe's history, and, and particularly in Germany, where what has developed in Germany is really a very unhealthy uh, situation where Germans, are, are unfortunately, of, of course, uh, the, some are, but I'm talking about the mainstream, uh, Germans are very uncritical about their history. Uh, instead of learning the lesson, I mean, you know, the, the absolute horrors of the genocide committed by the German government against European Jews, the lesson ought to be, I mean, this is the lesson I was taught, you know, never again for anyone. And the lesson that Germany seems to have learned is, is rather than being courageous about criticizing um, uh, human rights abuses wherever they are and standing up for people's rights wherever they are, uh, the lesson has been just unquestioning support for Israel arms sales to Israel, attacking people who are working for Palestinian human rights, attacking people who, uh, who support the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. And we've seen a recent uh, trend uh, which started in the United States but was then um, uh, uh, copied in Europe of appointing officials to be uh, sort of the anti-Semitism the, the, the person in charge of the fight against anti-Semitism. And, and let me be clear, in principle, I have no problem with appointing, um, you know, a, a, someone to uh, lead the fight against racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. That's a good thing. But what, the, the, what has actually happened in the United States and in, in Europe and country after country and at the EU level is the appointment of people who are very close to the Israel lobby and who spend very little time actually fighting anti-Semitism and a lot of time fighting the Palestinian rights movement. I mean, to take a shocking example, there was a, um, a piece, an article in the New York Times, uh, I think the day before yesterday, about the extent to which uh, German state institutions, including the police, have been infiltrated by neo-Nazis uh, with hit lists and death lists. And, and you know, and, and this has been exposed in, in recent years about the extent to which there are still Nazi networks in Germany. These uh, anti-Semitism commissioners are almost never talking about that. Instead, what they've been doing is pushing this um, misleading and politically motivated definition of anti-Semitism and trying to get governments and institutions to adopt it, it's a definition which basically equates criticism of Israel and Zionism on the one hand with anti-Jewish bigotry on the other. And that is the situation. And in Germany, they're taking it to an extreme. So um, uh, the, the German national anti-Semitism coordinator uh, uh, and the one just appointed by the state of Berlin have been very vocal in attacking uh, and smearing supporters of Palestinian rights to the point where this guy who was just appointed by the state of Berlin uh, tweeted in October, 
that, you know, apropos of nothing, that if you're, say, riding on a train and you hear someone mention the word Palestine, you should start screaming at them. Mm-hmm. And this is the guy who's in charge of, uh, you know, the state, the the state of Berlin's uh, fight against anti-Semitism. And in his tweet, he equated this, you know, saying the word Palestine with anti-Semitism. So that's what we're up against. But let me say that in Europe, there have also been significant and notable victories, including in June the uh, European Court of Human Rights, really in a landmark ruling, uh, ruled that support for the boycott of Israeli goods is a free speech right protected by the European Convention on Human Rights. And it overturned the convictions of 12 activists in France who had been criminally prosecuted by French authorities for calling on the Carrefour supermarket chain not to stock Israeli goods. Uh, And uh, they had been um, uh, prosecuted, criminally prosecuted, and and that was thrown out. And that was really a landmark uh, ruling upholding the right of European citizens to advocate for Palestinian human rights and indeed human rights in general. I want to ask you about... uh, uh the anti-BDS uh, re- resolutions. Uh, uh, more and more in our country and around the world, um, Canada being a recent example, there are resolutions and laws passed that are restricting speech critical of Israel. You just mentioned it in Germany as well. Do you see this as a backlash against the success of BDS or a case is two steps forward, three steps backward? I think it's primarily a backlash, but it definitely absorbs a lot of people's energy in trying to fight this. You know, that's time and energy we could spend educating and mobilizing people uh, for human rights. And I think part of the strategy of Israel lobby groups is simply to tie people up in these uh, battles or lawsuits or, or whatever else they come up with and absorb our energy. But nonetheless, I think it is a reactionary um, strategy from them. They, they really can't sell Israel. They don't have a positive message to sell Israel uh, as, you know, really a beacon of human rights or of, uh, uh, you know, wh- whatever other positive associations they may have with it. So all they can do is try to shut down the discussion. And so we do see these anti-BDS laws and resolutions across the country. I think something like uh, 25 U.S. states have passed uh, various kinds of anti-BDS legislation. But here I think it's, it's actually been a good news story uh, from the perspective of the movement for Palestinian rights because um, in every case, I think in, in all except one case I can think of, when these laws have been uh, challenged in court, they have been overturned as unconstitutional. Yeah. And we've seen federal challenges to them in, um, in Kansas, in Arizona, in Texas, that have all been successful. And um, we saw another very uh, worrying and damaging uh, strategy used by the Israel lobby is going after universities to silence academics and students. And um, so the Trump administration actually appointed uh, Kenneth Marcus as its chief enforcer of civil rights in the U.S. Department of Education uh, when Trump came in. Who is Kenneth Marcus? He is actually uh, a lifelong career Israel lobbyist who had pioneered the strategy of misusing the uh, U.S. Civil Rights Act to try to go after universities by claiming that universities that don't crack down on Palestine solidarity activism are harming their Jewish students, are creating a hostile atmosphere for their Jewish students. And this strategy under Kenneth Mar, you know, he, he was at an outfit called the Brandeis Center, which has nothing to do with Brandeis University. It's just an Israel lobby group. And they had gone after 
a dozen universities around the country during the Obama administration, including several University of California campuses, Rutgers, uh, Columbia, and others. And all of these cases were thrown out by the Department of, uh, by the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education. They were all baseless. They were all thrown out. They were all politically motivated. They actually tried then to take some of these same cases to federal court, uh, uh, the, the one at uh, UC Berkeley, for example, and that was thrown out of federal court. So then what happened after this total failure, the, uh, the Trump administration appointed Kenneth Marcus, the guy who actually made these complaints or coordinated these complaints, they put him in charge of adjudicating them, if you can imagine that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so he spent the past two, two and a half years as the head of civil rights going, you know, trying to advance these, uh, these complaints. Well, the good news is he just resigned uh, under a cloud. Uh, it turns out that he had improperly used his... Uh, he basically abused power. I mean, there were hundreds of genuine civil rights complaints that were awaiting uh, investigation and adjudication. He pushed all those aside in order to revive and give priority to the Rutgers complaint, which had already been thrown out and which he was allowing a, a pro-Israel group to refile just because he was there and perhaps he thought he could fix the result. So, you know, th this is uh, an example of where there are intense efforts at censorship, and they take up a lot of time and effort for people to fight back against them. But the good news story is they're not succeeding. And when you do fight back, you win. You know, those of us who know and respect uh, uh, Nora Arakat uh, have been grieving with her and her family. It's around 40 days now since uh, her nephew, uh, Ahmed Arakat, uh, was shot and killed by the Israeli military uh, on his way to his sister's uh, wedding. Um, uh, his body hasn't yet been released to the family. Do you have any updates or uh, uh, what? what what can you tell us about the situation? Well, it's, that was just a horrific uh, case. Uh, the killing of Ahmed Arakat is uh, yet another example of a young Palestinian being uh, basically extrajudicially executed uh, by Israeli forces. And um, it was caught on video, like many of these uh, horrific killings. But many more are not caught on video. So in this case, you could see that he presented absolutely no threat to the uh, people who gunned him down. And, and sadly, there is no um, venue, let's say, or no, no mechanism for real justice because, you know, the Israelis are literally a judge, jury, and executioner. So... Uh, there have been appeals by the family and by many Palestinian civil rights organizations uh, for, um, you know, international pressure and investigations on Israel. But I wish I could say that the, the case of Ahmed Arakat was unique. It's far from unique. There have been uh, literally dozens, hundreds of these extrajudicial killings, not to mention, of course, the uh, more than 200 Palestinians gunned down by snipers, including many children, medics, journalists, elderly people, Thank people God. using wheelchairs in the context of the Great March of Return protests in Gaza. So it, it's, it just uh, draws attention to the total impunity Israel enjoys because of the support from the United States and, of course, from the European Union and others. And, and that's why... I think it's so important to challenge the complicity of these institutions and to challenge the complicity of corporations, of universities that um, treat Israel like a normal country, that reward Israel uh, with, you know, very lucrative uh, relationships uh, while Israel is committing these kinds of crimes with impunity. We should also mention, of course, the uh, International Criminal Court, uh, which is 
inching ever so slowly towards opening a formal investigation into Israel's war crimes. And it has yet to happen. We're still waiting for the judges there to, um, to decide on the extent of the court's jurisdiction. Uh, but it's been, it's, it's been a years-long fight to get the ICC to actually start formally investigating these kinds of crimes. And, and one where I, I hope, I hope, things have been moving very, very slowly, too slowly in the right direction. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. I'm not willing to say sure. it's, it's a done deal. You know, we, uh, we've been very concerned about the prison population, the Palestinian prison population within Israel and the military prisons, uh, especially children and youth, and especially during this time of the pandemic when they're living, forced to live in these very, very close quarters where the disease or the virus can spread so easily. Um, catch us up with uh, what's happening there. Well, just in the last uh, week or so, there was a decision from the Israeli Supreme Court uh, in response to a challenge from human rights groups uh, a decision that Palestinian prisoners have no right to social distancing in Israeli detention. And this is, this is uh, sadly not surprising, but it's no less devastating because there are more than uh, 4,700 Palestinian political prisoners in Israel's prisons. That includes um, more than 160 children at the present time and about a thousand prisoners who are considered very vulnerable either due to chronic illness or old age. And there have been uh, repeated calls by uh, international bodies and by human rights groups, Palestinian, Israeli, and international, that Israel should release at the very least the children and the vulnerable prisoners, and yet it, it has not done so. And sadly, there have been documented cases of, of Palestinians who have been released uh, from prison uh, uh, with and then tested positive for the coronavirus. Um, and uh, there have been cases where uh, uh, Israeli prison guards have been known to be um, infected as well. So the, the prisons in, um, you know, in, in Israel where Palestinians are held, just like the prisons in the United States are uh, really ground zero for s some of the worst outbreaks, unfortunately, because people in prison are so vulnerable and are so powerless and unable to do the kinds of things we're all asked to do to protect themselves. And there the responsible parties are uh, those who uh, keep the prisons and keep people there and, and, uh, and, that, and so that's a crisis which is striking Palestinians uh, as it is striking uh, many uh, incarcerated people in the United States. I want to use that as a segue. Uh, um, uh, I've, I've interviewed, we've interviewed here uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris from the Poor People's Campaign. Uh, she's the, the co-chair with uh, Reverend William Barber uh, of the Poor People's Campaign. And they talk about the pandemic here as having exposed the fissures already, already uh, present uh, uh, in our country. And so I wanted to ask you uh, uh, to talk about some of these fissures that are present in our country and what the pandemic is teaching us about who we are uh, as a people and as an American society. Yeah. The, that's such a good way to put it, and it, it is, uh, it, it's a situation where we're, we can be personally very, you know, many of us, and as I said at the outset, I'm very thankful that, you know, I'm able to work at home, um, I'm able to remain uh, relatively safe. Uh, of course, the thing we all miss is the day-to-day -day contact with our friends, with our loved ones, with our colleagues. But at least for a certain amount of time, that's tolerable. What, what's not tolerable is the situation of people in uh, prison. What's not tolerable is to see 50 million people made unemployed, to see a third of, of households unable to pay their rent or mortgages, to see a looming uh, a, 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 a catastrophe 
that is is growing day by day and to see the political system completely paralyzed and unable to meet the needs uh, of the people in this country. People talk about the United States as a failed state. And uh, sadly, I think that's true in many ways. We, we see, um, we see uh, Congress able to pass a massive military budget of 740 or 750 uh, billion dollars with, with uh, barely a problem. And, uh, and they're still arguing about whether people who are at risk of losing their, losing their, their homes should get a couple of uh, hundred extra dollars a week just to hold on to the roof over their head. Yeah. And, and um, to see trillions of dollars doled out with barely a, uh, any discussion to major corporations, many, you know, under the pretext that this is going to save jobs. And many of those save, same corporations then turning around and saying, oh, well, we're going to be laying off, you know, X many thousand people as, as many of the airlines have done. So it's, it's intolerable. But at the same time, you know, I think at the beginning of this, I don't know how many of us expected the, uh, the huge upsurge or the resurgence in protest, the resurgence in resistance, the resurgence in radical demands for justice in this country, from defunding the police and prison abolition uh, to pressing demands for uh, a, you know, a basic income, um, health care, really things that people in a country this rich should be able to take for granted. And, uh, you know, maybe that's a sign of hope. I, I'm not trying to overestimate where we are. It, it's still a pretty dismal picture in so many ways. But people, uh, people are alive. Communities are alive and they're fighting and struggling uh, to, not just to survive, but to actually make a better world than the one uh, that, is, that is behind us. And in Palestine, you know, the, the, we were all, many of us, aware of the fissures. But again, this pandemic has exposed so many of them, uh, particularly in the way Israel has uh, responded uh, to the pandemic in terms of Palestinians. It has really uh, done nothing to ameliorate the situation and much to make it worse, including um, uh, uh, refusing to loosen the siege of Gaza, uh, including uh, subjecting Palestinian d laborers who have to go from the West Bank to Israel to earn money to feed their families. They have been exposed to the virus and then taken it back to their communities in the West Bank because they have no choice but to do that to survive. And, uh, and, and so it, it has in so many ways exacerbated the uh, already pre-existing injustices. I, I, have a, I have a question that's got two parts to it, Ali, so if you'll bear with me. Um, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the protests and demonstrations that are going on in uh, cities around the country. Uh, they've raised all kinds of issues, including systemic racism, the Black Lives Movement, police state violence, the Israelification of American domestic security. So I want you to say a word about, about that. But when we were interviewing our, our mutual friend, Max Blumenthal, he said that, uh, and this is almost a quote, the Israel lobby sees the Black Lives Movement as a threat. So can you weave a, a, a response to those two parts of that question? Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, I, I've written uh, a couple of articles in the past few months precisely about how the Israel lobby views the Black Lives Matter movement as a threat. And this goes back a number of years, particularly uh, it goes back to 2014 after the uh, police killing of um, the teenager Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and with the uprising that that sparked, where we saw that, of course, happened during the same summer that Israel was bombing Gaza and killing, on average, 11 children a day in the summer of 2014. And uh, so there was this, this reawakening of a black Palestinian solidarity between the United States and Palestine. 
uh, and a new awareness. Of course, those, that solidarity goes back uh, many years, many decades to the 1960s, to the black radical movements that were internationalist, that saw Palestine as, as an anti-colonial struggle. Uh, but it reawakened in 2014. And what we saw after that was the Israeli government and Israel lobby groups really worried about the resurgence of, uh, of black and Palestinian solidarity. Why? Because the Black Lives Matter movement has a great deal of legitimacy, uh, particularly on the left, particularly among grassroots. And uh, so they were just very worried about bringing the issue of Palestine into that fold. Uh, so, you know, you take uh, Israel lobby groups, for example, the Anti-Defamation League, which is one I wrote about recently, which um, pose in the United States, they try to pose as very progressive, uh, very much about interfaith and intercommunity and interracial relations and so on. But of course, they're supporters of Israeli apartheid, and yeah. they spend much of their effort um, trying to attack supporters of Palestinian human rights. So they actually had an internal memo that was leaked a few weeks ago to the publication Jewish Currents, laying out uh, precisely this dilemma of how they can continue to appear to be progressive in the US on issues like Black Lives Matter while maintaining their support for Israel. And it's a conundrum they can't solve because what's also being exposed in all of this is the close ties between the American state apparatuses of repression at the federal, state, and local level and Israel. That's what you might call the Israelification, where many of these same Israel lobby groups have for decades been engaged in taking uh, all the top police and law enforcement officials, and we're talking about FBI, Department of Homeland Security, state police, local police, from the city of Chicago, from New York, from pre pretty much any sizable American city. I guarantee you a top delegation of police officers has gone on one of these junkets to Israel, which are sponsored by APAC. Yeah. the American Jewish Committee, the Anti-Defamation League, and others, but they're all involved in it. And the, and the way they market it is, oh, Israel is so experienced in dealing with terrorism and security threats, and we're so smart at this. Come and see how we do it. So you can go back to the United States and apply the lessons you've learned. And that was a very good uh, marketing strategy post 9-11. But in the era of Black Lives Matter, there's a backlash against it because people are, is, uh, are saying, why are our police driving down the streets in tanks? Why are our police in camouflage? Why are our police carrying assault rifles and wearing night goggles as if they're soldiers and we're their enemy? And uh, I don't want to give the, you know, let's be very clear. Uh, we should not in any way take uh, the idea that, you know, but for Israel, American police would be uh, great and would not be racist. You know, sadly, U.S. police forces need lessons in racism from nobody. Uh, but what it is is that Israel, uh, in a way, provides an opportunity to launder this racism as uh, you know, sophisticated techniques and technology that are quote-unquote battle-tested. Uh, and tested on the ground. What does that mean? That means tested on Palestinians under military occupation. It means tested on Palestinians in Gaza, caged in what is effectively a giant ghetto, and marketing that to American police departments. So this growing awareness, uh, which comes through the Black-led struggle of the Black Lives Matter movement, is... Uh, another enormous challenge to the uh, Israeli and Israel lobby narrative that they don't know how to deal with. But that, in a nutshell, is why they see, um, why Israel and its lobby see Black Lives Matter as a growing threat. 
I, I want you to say a word. I want I want to take us back to Palestine and Israel. And I want you to say a word about the seizure last week of BDS movement general coordinator Mahmoud Nawaja and the arrest the week before a husband and wife. Now they've been they've been released. I understand, but uh, uh, the arrest the week before of Suhail Khoury of the Edward Said National Music Conservatory and his wife, uh, Rania Elias of the Yabus Cultural Center from Beit Hanina. Say a word about just these kind of uh, uh, arrests that are taking place now under the guise really of the pandemic. I mean, Israel's getting away with an awful lot under the guise of the pandemic now these days. Yeah, let me say regarding the arrests in Jerusalem of uh, uh, related to the Edward Said Conservatory and the Yabus Cultural Center, uh, this is part of a long-running campaign by Israel, a long-running crackdown to destroy any Palestinian cultural and institutional presence in occupied East Jerusalem. It's about um, erasing, attempting to erase the Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, and Christian character of Jerusalem, and to remake Jerusalem as a Jewish-only theme park. And this goes back, of course, some of us will remember Israel shutting down Orient House in East Jerusalem. And since then, it has shut down many, many uh, Palestinian cultural institutions in the city. So that's the context in which we have to see the attacks on the cultural institutions in Jerusalem. As regards the ar arrest of Mahmoud Nawaja, what happened was that last Thursday, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, dozens of Israeli soldiers ar arrived at the house of Mahmoud Nawaj near Ramallah. He is a very respected human rights defender and the general coordinator of the nonviolent boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. They arrived at his house, dozens of soldiers with dogs, dragged him out of his house in front of his young children, and uh, took him away. It was uh, caught on video, him being taken away, blindfolded and handcuffed. This is a man whose entire um, uh, you know, work is based on the idea of nonviolence and solidarity, building nonviolent solidarity around the world. But I think it just shows the extent to which Israel views uh, nonviolent solidarity and the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is a threat. It shows how powerful these tools are uh, and how scared Israel are, is of them. But what they did is they took him away for interrogation. He's still in detention. A military judge extended his detention for 15 days, which could be extended indefinitely. And he has not been allowed to see a lawyer. So very little is known. Uh, as to what conditions Mahmoud Nawaja is being held in or, or what they're doing. But this is clearly part of Israel's long-running effort to smear the BDS movement as quote-unquote terrorist and to intimidate uh, its leaders. And it's exactly what you would expect from a regime like Israel's. And as Omar Barghouti, a co-founder of the BDS movement, said, it's very reminiscent of the tactics that Israel... Um, uh, sorry, that apartheid South Africa used to uh, deploy. And I have been trying to get a statement from the European Union on this for a number of days. I had a written promise from them that I would get a statement, and I'm still waiting for that. But this, again, shows, I think, the complicity of the European uh, governments who, uh, you know, uh, talk night and day about how much they support human rights. But here we have a clear case of a human rights defender being dragged out of his home in handcuffs and a blindfold in the middle of the night. And almost a week later, they still can't bring themselves to utter a word about it. It's absolutely reprehensible. We have a question from the chat room. Uh, what about dark-skinned Jews, Armenians, and other groups that are being mistreated? Well, you know, Israel, even among Israeli society, Israeli Jewish society, uh, Israel is a caste system. At the bottom of the rung are Palestinians. Uh, and even Palestinians, there are castes. You know, the, the lowest of the low from the perspective of Israel uh, are Palestinians in Gaza, uh, then Palestinians in the West Bank, then Palestinian citizens of Israel. Then you get to, to, to um, non-Jewish so-called guest workers in Israel, you know, people 
who've come from the Philippines or Thailand or somewhere else. Then you get to Jew Jewish society, and even within Jewish society, it's a caste system where uh, it's very, very strongly racialized. And, and historically, uh, you know, Jews from um, uh, Arab origin countries were at the bottom of the rung. But since uh, Israel uh, brought uh, Ethiopians to the country in the 80s, in the 1980s, uh, uh, you know, black Jews, Ethiopian origin Jews have really been at the bottom of the rung in terms of Jewish society. They still enjoy uh, some of the privileges that uh, come with being Jewish in a, uh, you know, ethnocracy like Israel, but uh, face uh, extreme discrimination with respect to other Jewish communities. So really, you know, when, when we talk about justice and equality, when we talk about, uh, you know, equality between Israeli Jews and Palestinians as a hopeful future, we really want to extend that, that uh, equality to everyone. And, uh, and that includes within the Jewish society, uh, not just between, uh, you know, Israeli Jews and others. I'm going to get to uh, the presidential, uh, I'm going to get to Joe Biden in just a second. Uh, to, to, to wrap us up, but I, I, did want, I didn't want you to get away from us, Ali. Uh, you're a, a, a journalist, a respected journalist, and so I wanted to get your take on uh, the recent open letter by a number of authors, including J.K. Rowling, Noam Chomsky, uh, Salman Rushdie, Margaret Atwood, and Harper's Magazine, decrying the freedom of speech uh, by what's come to be known, right, as, as cancel culture. Their letter was met with a backlash uh, by a number of commentators on the left, including our friend uh, in Nazareth, Jonathan Cook. So, uh, Ali, what's, what's your take on the letter and the backlash? And if you'd like to include the resignation of Barry Weiss from New York Times, who attacked uh, in strenuous terms one of our upcoming interviewees, Linda Sarsour. Mm. I'm assuming you have an opinion or two about this. I do. Uh, of course, you know, in principle, of course, I'm in favor of free speech. Of course, I'm against punishing people for expressing their opinions or firing them. But this letter was just a, 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 an exercise in the most, uh, you know, uh, disgusting hypocrisy and narcissism. Narcissism. That doesn't mean that I uh, dislike everyone who signed it uh, or disrespect everyone who signed it. But I certainly disrespect many of the people who signed it. For example, um, Barry Weiss, who you mentioned, and um, Kerry Nelson, uh, another name that comes to mind, because Barry Weiss, who was until recently a, a New York Times uh, opinion editor, made her name uh, a few years back uh, while she was a student at Columbia University by leading a crusade to have uh, professors fired uh, for speaking out right. about Palestinian rights. So this is someone who believes very strongly in punishing people for their speech. This is a person who very strongly opposes academic freedom if, they, if people disagree with her, uh, you know, unquestioning support for Israel. So the sheer hypocrisy of her, um, you know, signing this letter and trying to launder herself as a supporter of free speech was ab absolutely uh, appalling. And similar with Kerry Nelson, who is a former president of the American Association of University Professors and a retired professor from the University of Illinois, who had been a leading voice uh, supporting the firing of Stephen Salaita from the University of Illinois because he had spoken out about Israel's murder of Palestinians during the summer of 2014. Uh, so again, Kerry Nelson wants to tell us he's in favor of free speech. He definitely wasn't in favor of the free speech of Stephen Salaita. So really that, that in sum is why I found it so hypocritical. And really what they seem to be complaining about was that rich privileged people like JK Rowling don't like getting, um, you know, criticized online when they, they, they say things people disagree with. That, that seems to have been their main complaint. They didn't like that James Bennett, the uh, New York Times opinion editor, was 
uh, fired after he published uh, the op-ed by Tom Cotton, uh, you know, basically calling for the U.S. military to invade cities and violently put down Black Lives Matter protests. I saw this letter very much as an attack on also on the Black Lives Matter movement, because why were they complaining at that particular moment when all of these people, as far as I, or the vast majority of them anyway, have been completely silent about what we talked about earlier on. 25 states have passed anti-BDS laws. We've seen people fired, students harassed and intimidated and disciplined for speaking out critically of Israel or in support of Palestinian human rights. And none of those people were decrying cancel culture at that time. So it's just very hypocritical. One last, one last question. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, Joe Biden. Um, I mean, we know Trump is a disaster, right? Uh, the president is a disaster with regard to Palestinian rights. Joe Biden, of course, has been an absolutist supporter of Israel uh, throughout his uh, decades-long career in Congress and even as vice president. Uh, he, he, he has said he doesn't support the annexation. Uh, but he's promised to keep any disagreements he has with Israel uh, uh, private. Um, we're reminded that he will put humanitarian aid for Palestinian back in his uh, budget. Um, um, so I want you to say a word about president uh, about uh, 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 the presidential nominee for the Democrats, Joe Biden. Weave into that. In a Washington Post uh, recent poll, 67% of respondents said that it's acceptable or even the duty of elected representatives to question the Israel-US relationship. And among Democrats, it's 81%. So what's the strategy for us activists, assuming, and we can't assume, but assuming a Biden presidency? How do we hold his feet to the fire? Well, I, I have very little hope that you would get anything out of a Biden administration on Palestine. I think that they are, they're not going to reverse most of the steps that uh, Trump took. He's very pointedly has not said he will remove the US embassy from Jerusalem. Um, and uh, he has been very clear also that he won't condition U.S. military aid to Israel. And uh, frankly, I, I, I very much doubt that Biden can be pressured on this issue. Uh, uh, and the same goes for many other issues. For example, if after everything that's happened in this, this uh, you know, catastrophic pandemic, where so many more people need health care, he's still not willing to entertain Medicare for all, then what, you know, then what, what would happen? And, and this is before an election when this is an incredibly popular policy. Uh, you know, 90% of Democrats support Medicare for all. And, you know, you get majorities of Republicans who support it as well. He's not willing to shift on that before an election. Don't expect him to do so after. And I think a similar, similar analysis applies with respect to Palestine. But, uh, tr uh, you know, in the best case scenario, Biden is a transitional figure, either to something better or, you know, heaven forbid, to something worse. Uh, but what we have to work for is, I think, uh, the medium run or the long run, where we continue to educate people, we continue to mobilize them, people continue to work at the grassroots level. We started this conversation by talking about all the hopeful victories we've seen in recent primaries. We continue to build at that base and, and uh, not be discouraged by what happens uh, at the top, which I, I'm not very optimistic about. The other thing I want to say about uh, a, a potential Biden administration that's very, very worrying is that I think it's inevitable he's going to bring back, uh, you know, the sort of um, neo, neoliberal slash neoconservative foreign policy establishment of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, the Samantha Rices, the Susan, uh, the Samantha Powers, the Susan Rices, 
all these people from the Washington think tanks who have been the architects of catastrophic wars and interventions that are still ongoing, whether you talk about the war in Libya, the uh, pumping of a billion dollars worth of weapons into uh, Syria to fuel a civil war and a proxy war there during the Obama administration, the escalation of tensions with Russia, which really escalated under the Obama administration and under Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, instead of seeking, um, uh, you know, de-escalation. And uh, remember, it was uh, Obama who, who started talking about the pivot to Asia, which really meant militarizing the South China Sea and, uh, uh, you know, heading towards a confrontation with China. These are all exactly the the opposite of what we, we should be doing. And, you, you know, of course, Donald Trump is horrible. I don't need to waste time talking about that. But look at where the criticism of Donald Trump comes from uh, in the foreign policy establishment. It's not that Donald Trump isn't doing enough for world peace, that Donald Trump isn't doing enough for de-escalation. They criticize him from the right. They say, oh, Donald Trump is too soft on Russia, when this is not true at all. Oh, Donald Trump is too soft on China. We have Nancy Pelosi talking up sanctions on, uh, on China, uh, and so on. They're, they're, they're criticizing him for withdrawing troops from Germany, when in fact we should be seeking to bring U.S. forces home and close down wasteful military bases around the world. They attacked him for starting a dialogue with North Korea. Even though it went nowhere and Donald Trump is a fool, the instinct was right. And all of the attacks from the foreign policy establishment listened to them time after time. They want more confrontation. They want more U.S. aggression around the world. And sadly, those are the people that will be in charge of Joe Biden's foreign policy. So we have to be attentive not just on the question of Palestine, but attentive that a Biden administration is going to ramp up U.S. intervention and aggression around the world like never before. And that will be lauded by a lot of people as being like, we're putting things right after Trump uh, did them wrong. You know, I said that was going to be our last question, but I do have one more uh, from uh, your good friend, Don Wagner. So let me just read the question to you. I mean, he Hi, Don. Yeah, he could, uh, he could drive over to your house and ask this question, but I'll, I'll ask it for him. As long um, as he has a mask on. <laughs> what are the prospects of a grassroots movement on sanctions toward Israel to complement BDS? Too far a reach or something we should be pressing from the grassroots? What a good question. And I'm guessing my good friend Don knows the answer to that, which is we absolutely should be pressing for that. Uh, and it's not, it's not too much of a reach because, again, look at the discussion that is happening within the Democratic Party and the grassroots now, where many politicians are, uh, are, are, are making, a point, making it a point of pride to say that I support putting conditions on U.S. military aid to Israel. Do those politicians go as far as I would like them to? Of course they don't. But... That was unthinkable even a few years ago that we would talk about putting conditions on U.S. military aid. So it's not a reach. We absolutely have to do it. We can, we can. The thing I want people to remember is that all of these changes, however incremental they seem, are because of the work uh, groups like yours and many people on this call and many others that we know around the country have been doing for decades. And that includes Don. Don is, has been doing tremendous work for decades. And that work is bearing fruit now. We're seeing the fruit of that work in these changes. As frustratingly slow as they are, that's because of us collectively. So absolutely, we should be pressing for it. And the other thing is, you don't get what you don't ask for. And this is, this is something I really can't stress enough. Don't ask only for what you think you should get, because then history doesn't move if you only ask for what you think you can get now. Ask for what you know you can't get now, because that's where we want things to move.
and they will only move that way if we press to go much, much further than anyone thinks we can now. So absolutely, sanctions is something we should be asking for and pressing for. Ali, thank you for coming today. Uh, any parting words for us? Well, I just want to thank you, Michael, and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace for keeping this discussion and this cause of justice alive. Um, this has been invigorating for me, and uh, I know this is a time when many of us feel isolated, and so this kind of community and this kind of sense of collective discussion and collective action is, is important at any time, incredibly now, uh, especially now. And um, I just want to enc encourage everyone to continue this work and continue this discussion. Um, what gets me up in the morning is the conviction that we can make the world better and more peaceful and more just. And, um, you know, the, the work we do bears fruit, whether it's in our time or the time of our children, uh, we just have to keep doing it. And uh, I'm very encouraged by seeing so many struggles for justice in the world, particularly the Black-led uh, Black Lives Matter movement in this country, which I think is really the conscience of the United States at this moment, and in many ways, the conscience of the world. And um, we have to keep pressing for justice in every way we can. And thank you for, for playing such an important uh, part in, in that. You uh, believe even more than ever that the Palestinians are winning. I have no alternative but to believe that. And uh, it, it, it will be true because we make it true. And, uh, and, and let's just remember that the Palestinians winning doesn't mean triumph over other people. It means, in my, in my mind, it means a triumph for justice for everyone.